Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child using the method of catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. Today, we have Celine Mitchell back on the podcast to speak about the Montessori philosophy of sensitive periods and how this helps us with the spiritual growth of children. In the book, Listening to God with Children, Gianna Gobi says, A greater understanding of the needs of the child in the psychic sphere can aid us in understanding and respecting the needs of the child in the religious sphere. To know at least to some degree the true nature of the child means to help the child in ways that will allow him or her to develop as an integrated or whole person, one who is in the right relationship with self, with God, and with others. I hope you enjoy. Celine, welcome back to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. Thank you so much, Carrie. Thank you for inviting me to do this. I'm so glad you're here again. For all of our listeners, Celine joined us. Oh, God. What, how when was that? Like uh, six months ago? Longer well, than that. Maybe a year ago. I, I think it was last spring. <laughs> I think that's crazy. Where Celine shared about how she has shared Good Shepherd, the Catechesis of Good Shepherd work through all over the world and in your missionary work and your missionary heart. And I love that story. Well, Celine, would you tell us a little bit for anybody who didn't listen to that episode. Tell us a little bit about who you are. So I am um, a wife, a mother, and a grandmother of uh, soon eight grandchildren. (laughs) And I wanted to be a missionary when I was younger, but you know, life happens when you're making plans. Mm -hmm. And so after uh, our children were grown and I discovered Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, I had the opportunity to actually share this beautiful ministry with um, the Missionaries of Charity and um, became a a missionary working from home. (laughs) Well, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And how long have you been with the catechesis work? Uh, I think it's about 18 years. And so I... It's hard to imagine it's been that long, but especially um, the last 10 years since 2011, everything has changed. Um, my husband even took all three levels of catechesis of the Good Shepherd courses. Wow. Um, we bought a retreat center. We have a pond. We have 21 acres. And so it's just that Psalm 23 that we get to experience daily. Mm, how lucky you are. How beautiful. We are blessed. <laughs> <laughs> well, Celine, I'm really glad that you have joined us on the podcast. We are going to be talking about sensitive periods, which as I was reading up for this episode, I just got it so good. We just had Claire Paglia on the podcast who spoke about the planes of development, which was chapter nine in listening to God with children. And you and I are going to dive into the sensitive periods, which is chapter 10 of listening to God with children. So it's just perfect. Yes, it's amazing. And I uh, listened to Claire's podcast. And so now we'll delve into those planes and what happens with those sensitive periods. How exciting. Yeah. So tell us, what are sensitive periods? What are they? Well, Montessori uh, described them in several different ways. They are like uh, windows of opportunity. Um, She also said it's like if you walk into a dark room, but uh, the light comes on. And so you see things uh, in that light. And so there are those particular moments in the child's life Mm -hmm. that um, regular education has called it developmental milestones, that the child is super attracted to particular things, like a magnet that draws them. They just can't... um, Really, it's not about their own control of it. They're they're just mm-hmm. drawn to do particular things at particular times. Mm-hmm. She also used the analogy of the French botanist of Vries, um, and Claire talked about the four stages of development as that 
um, the egg and the caterpillar, um, those different mm-hmm. stages of the butterfly. And so when we look at that egg, when it is hatched, that caterpillar, it, it's so interesting. The butterfly doesn't uh, plant that or, or deposit the egg in the brightest, um, most nutritious spot. But that little caterpillar, once the egg is hatched, has to and is naturally drawn to the light. And so this this like instinct within is that sensitive period of the child when at particular times they are drawn to this particular light. So like the first uh, sensitive period is movement. And, you know, from birth on, especially birth through age one, we know those children, Mm -hmm. even um, you mentioned you have a, a new three-month-old, and even in their sleep, mm-hmm. they're moving. Yep. <laughs> the the movement constantly, but that movement becomes more controlled movement later. Mm-hmm. There is that sensitive period for language, and that sensitive period for language is actually that whole first plane of development. Uh, I also, besides talking about the Um, sensitive periods, I want to connect them with why this is so important for us to know in the atrium. Yes. If movement is the sensitive period of that young child, and if language is the sensitive period, we're going to provide those opportunities in the atrium for movement, for language. You know, we always think the good child is the one who doesn't move, the one who sits still. Mm -hmm. And Montessori had used um, the analogy, you know, we are in the animal kingdom. Animal means movement. So we have to move. So in the atrium, we offer opportunities for that child's movement, like procession, (laughs) like Mm -hmm. moving particular objects um, that sensitive period for language is actually my favorite sensitive period to talk about regarding the atrium because we know children are hungry for words they're hungry for big words they want to know what is this and so that nomenclature they want to try and say them yes yeah and it's so sweet try to say extinguisher not just a snuffer but an extinguisher (laughs) Um, and and so that they love these these big words but if we know that this nomenclature is so important in Montessori we transfer this to faith formation in the atrium with what I call lol the language of the liturgy Mm. and and so giving them the language of our faith, which if given at a young age, really does become like that mother language. It's not just a second language we learn much later that is harder to acquire, because we know it's harder after the age of uh, seven in that second plane. It's harder to learn a new foreign language. Mm -hmm. But in that sensitive period for language, in that first plane of development, um, children can naturally be bilingual. They can, I know a family that's trilingual. Mm -hmm. And, And so what if the language of our faith is not just taught, but is lived starting at a very young age? So what I hear you saying is that these children, especially in the first plane of development, are very sensitive to specific things like language. And like you were saying how it's like the light is on for language at that time, or that is what their their bodily and mental and emotional natural tendencies are, maybe, are towards these specific things like language and movement and order. And so we capitalize on their sensitivity to to it by introducing, or maybe introducing is not the right word, but creating an environment that is rich in movement, in order, in uh, language, et cetera, so that 
they absorb as much as possible. And this makes me think about like what you were saying with the language of the liturgy, where we introduce the children to things like chalice, patent, lavabo, epiclesis, these beautiful words. And we introduce them to three-year-olds and four-year-olds and five-year-olds because they are in that sensitive period of language, they're absorbing it in this really beautiful, amazing, natural, um, easy way. I've seen a lot of kids who are in our program who then they become altar servers. And the man at our church who actually trains altar servers, he always says to me, he can tell the kids who've been in Good Shepherd because they're like, okay, so I need to grab the lavabo and help wash the priest's hands. <laughs> and he knows that they're Good Shepherd kids because they they know the words, because they went through that sensitive period of language with an environment that was rich in liter- language of the liturgy. Yes, uh, exactly. And uh, I know of a child who now he's in high school already, but his grandmother had taken him um, the Monday after the Sunday um, that he received First Holy Communion. And that Monday morning he was in church and he asked um, Father if he could serve. And Mm -hmm. he's like, what? And he says, well, I've been in catechesis. I know the names <laughs> and I know what you're <laughs> doing. And so um, mm-hmm. the the first day after he received Holy Communion, there he was, an altar server. Because yes, these... That's beautiful. When they um, are, I don't want to use the word learn, but um, you know, when they are exposed because they are that absorbent mind in that first plane, that sponge, naturally they absorb these things. In fact, we know now even toddlers absorb that language of the liturgy so much easier. It's always there. It it doesn't have to be studied and learned later on. And this language mm-hmm. also because, you know, as you mentioned, the altar uh, materials in the atrium, the young child... Uh, from the age of one through around around the age of four, there's a sensitive period for small objects. Mm. And so in the atrium environment, we have the smaller objects of the articles of the mass, the articles of the altar, so that they can handle them, they can touch them, move them. We know we they have a sensitive period for order, And it's actually such a short period between the ages of two and four. And so they are attentive for doing particular things in a particular way. And um, I got the opportunity to observe in a level one atrium environment just this week, because currently this year I'm in uh, level three. Mm -hmm. But as I was observing in the level one, I was watching this young child, probably about three and a half to four, preparing the altar. Now, we always show preparation of the altar in a particular way. This is the altar, the table, altar cloth, paten, chalice, crucifix, candles. Mm -hmm. Well, the child put the candles first, and then he put the crucifix So kind of the opposite way, but as everything was on, except for the altar cloth, he looked at this. And, you know, as an observer, sometimes we adults want to jump in and fix things. Mm -hmm. But it was so beautiful because of this sensitive period of order, even though, you know, he did it kind of out of order, he recognized, oops. (laughs) And all of a sudden, he just made this gesture like, Oh, my. And then took everything off one at a time, put the altar cloth on, and then restored it in that proper order. And I was just, I said, thank you, Jesus. Like, I got to watch this. They have this need for order. And we know that in that first plane, in that first half of that plane, when things are out of order, you know, it actually upsets them. Yeah. They have that meltdown and temper tantrum. But 
this need for order really is so helpful in the atrium because there's a particular process in our liturgy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has a beautiful order. Mm -hmm. We also know they have that sensitive period for music starting at that age of two. Although my daughter is, is pregnant with her third child and they are a musical family. And so each child, the, the first two girls also have musical talents and gifts because they've been exposed to this. Yes. So yeah. we know also now, depending what they have been exposed to, even in utero, you know, that language in utero that music in utero also uh, impacts those other planes of development. Mm -hmm. But that sensitive period for music, you know, we present liturgical music in the atrium. And so when they're in church, you know, we know that GPL, it nourishes greater participation in the liturgy naturally. And so it works both ways. What they hear in church they also want to sing and do and repeat mm -hmm. in the atrium. Mm -hmm. And what they experience in the atrium, they want to also do in the liturgy. Mm -hmm. And I also find that that sensitive period for music really sometimes intertwines with in sensitive period for language because they want to sing about yes. these words that we have just talked about. <laughs> Yes, and music is another form of language. Yeah, in prayer, yes. Uh, and, it's, and it's even easier to remember particular words when they yes. come in a song. Yes, that's very true. That's very true. This makes me really excited about our infant-toddler atrium because it, it, it's like we're capitalizing on this first plane even more by working with the younger children, even younger children, that one and a half to three year old, when they're in all of these sensitive periods for really beautiful things for to expose them to different pieces of our faith at an even younger level when they're at an even younger age, when they're absorbing that in a very particular way, when they're in that sensitive period. It's really exciting. Yes. And often... We don't really give them credit for what that amazing mind can absorb yeah. because they're moving and we think they're not paying attention when they're moving, yeah. but they, they really are. There's a story um, my daughter shared when her daughter Cecilia was two because she had learned the you know nomenclature, altar, chalice, mm -hmm. patent, and they were at mass one day and they always sit up front and at the elevation of the host and elevation of the chalice Lori or I'm sorry Cecilia just proclaimed like chalice Aww. and Maria said she was a little embarrassed and I said no she was teaching the rest of the congregation <laughs> maybe they didn't know <laughs> But when they learn these words, they are eager to say them. Mm -hmm. They repeat them. Mm -hmm. And we know repetition is so important. It's it's part of that sensitive period. They keep repeating things over and over until they have reached the fulfillment of that particular activity. And, and so they want to say these things. Mm -hmm. you know, they want to sing those those songs. It's just so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So another one is grace and courtesy. The grace and courtesy between um, the ages of two and six, it's more intense between two and four. We have that opportunity for those manners and they learn that by our example, the police, you know. So when we ask them to restore particular articles and we add the words please and thank mm. you they will do that too but don't we have those uh, beautiful manners in church too like i often think about those eucharistic prayers you know uh, we grace uh, gracious lord often it's not just, you know, Lord God, mm -hmm. but we graciously, there's there, that word grace, 
gracious is used so much in the liturgy. Mm-hmm. And so it's an example of, you know, that that kindness, the proper use. And the children, we want to nourish their self-esteem, but self-esteem is that self-respect. Mm-hmm. And so when they are polite and courteous to each other, they feel good about that. And in the atrium, we give them that opportunity of those mixed ages so that those six-year-olds, five-year-olds set that example for that younger child. Mm-hmm. But even in, in toddler, it's just so beautiful when you know they give us something and we say thank you or when we ask for something and we say please because mm-hmm. that's nurturing that grace and courtesy uh, for them as well. Oh, we have that sensitive period for writing. I experienced that in my home, um, although our three children went to Montessori preschool. Um, I uh, didn't study that much about Montessori at that time, but uh, each one around the age of four, I recall, had a sensitive period for writing and did um, use their crayons on our walls. (laughs) And so uh, we often uh, see that. And so we need to provide more paper. But that sensitive period for writing then in the atrium um, can also be addressed with those tracing packets we have. Mm -hmm. Uh, We don't need to expose them to the different language nomenclature cards we have in a Montessori environment. But again, that language of the liturgy. And so um, perhaps for those older children after the age of four, tracing and writing those words that we have in the tracing packet, Mm -hmm. chalice, patten, um, the different infancy narratives, those prayer words, Hail Mary. And so that that writing, Mm -hmm. Um, they're sensitive. um, Well, the one I didn't mention, the sensitive period for the senses, which is so critical, sensorial. Little children, they have to touch everything. And we know with the younger ones, the infants, their first senses to be developed is is the mouth. So mm-hmm. they have to taste. Mm-hmm. They put everything in the mouth. If it tastes good, then okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but with the older one, the sensorial is so key. The, that's why we need to have that prepared environment that resembles the church, that is preparation for the church, so that the child can touch. How can they touch the the beautiful, real chalice and paten? And so we give them those sensorial experiences. Montessori said how critical that is. The, the hand is the instrument of the heart. Mm-hmm. And so we give them those opportunities to use their hands by mm-hmm. touching all the beautiful things um, related to our faith and our liturgy, our scripture to mm-hmm. God. Mm-hmm. So are the sensitive periods limited to just the first plane? I don't know if limited is the right word, but you know what I mean. Are they, do you only find them <laughs> in the first plane? <laughs> oh, so that's a great question. Um, we usually talk about them the most in that first plane because they are so critical in human development but yes that there are different sensitive periods because just like that caterpillar Mm -hmm. you know as it's growing um that it it needs different kinds of food and so uh, we know that in the second um plane of development, there's a sensitive period we call moral reasoning. Uh, There's a sensitive period for morality that they want to know what's right, what's wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not that moral formation begins then, because moral formation begins even in utero, but the the learning, um, that's why we have so many moral parables 
to be able to give the children the examples of what was the right choice Mm -hmm. because they need to learn um, how to make a right choice so that um, sensitive period in the second plane is also for culture and for uh, society, for their group. Mm -hmm. Um, That's what we often call the second period, that herd group, the herd mentality. Very social. Mm -hmm. They want to belong to a group, the social plane. Yes. And so they are hungry for not only knowledge, but knowledge of one's culture, um, knowledge of the moral code, Mm -hmm. knowledge of how to work within a group, how to understand society. So that's that second plane. The third plane, because they're trying to discover how they fit in society, the sensitive period is for that understanding one's place in society, my role. So each plane does have a different sensitive period, but it is so important for that child in that first plane to have that freedom to develop their sensitive period when that time comes. Mm Mm-hmm. So, like, another example, back to the first plane, um, the children at different times have sensitive period for cutting. Well, it's a movement, it's a tactile exploration, and and so if we don't provide opportunity for them to cut in particular ways, you know, I've, I've had conversation with parents where the child has cut the drapes or you know the child has cut their hair um, because they have a sensitive period to cut so let's provide scissors and cutting so if the children aren't given that freedom in a prepared environment in that first plane of development to nourish to experience their sensitive period It's like the light hasn't been turned on, but they have the need to be in the light. Mm -hmm. And so then there will be issues in the second plane that they need to revisit some of these things that haven't been acquired in the first plane. Mm -hmm. So would you speak into like when a sensitive period ends, what does that look like and how does that change? Like if a child has a sensitive period for cutting and that's over, what's different? There's another sensitive period that comes. So it's kind of like that caterpillar that's moving from one leaf to the next leaf on a vine, getting closer to that time of that next plane, the chrysalis stage. Mm -hmm. But they're hungry for something else. So it, it returns, but it's just a little different. It's a little different, mm-hmm. yeah. Yes, yes. And so they'll be doing bigger works, putting things together. And that's, you know, the second plane were is synthesizing those works. Mm-hmm. But in that first plane, so, you know, for example, the order. In the first plane we have that sensitive period for external order. Things have to be put in the same place. If they're out of place, um, it disrupts the child's um, peace peace of mind. Mm -hmm. And so they will express it, (laughs) perhaps in, in anger and crying. But in the second plane, there is a need for internal order. And so the external order is Mm. like, well, they become more sloppy. Um, They don't put things back in in the same place. Uh, Interesting, we have more order in level one atrium sometimes than when I was in level two atrium. Mm -hmm. Yes. They would forget where these things go. 
Because they are more interested in the internal order than the external. That's very interesting. Yes. Yeah, I can hear all the mothers listening to this episode thinking, oh, I've screwed up. (laughs) I didn't pay attention to my children's (laughs) sensitive period to cutting or order or movement or language. And I didn't capitalize on those sensitive periods when they happened. And now that door is shut. So... So what would you say to those moms that are feeling discouraged about that? Well, I wouldn't say the door is shut, um, but it's just that in the first plane, that um, sensitive period is like this super hunger. Mm -hmm. And so when that great hunger, uh, you know, is not filled there'll be something else that fills it. Mm -hmm. But perhaps that child will still be hungry, (laughs) not as obviously hungry. And sometimes, Mm -hmm. you know, just like with physical food, like, oh, I see you're searching for something to eat. Yes. (laughs) Okay, let me show you this. And so there is still that opportunity, um, you know, if we use the word catch up. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes that opportunity comes when there is a sibling or when there's an opportunity to work with a younger child. And so Mm -hmm. another beautiful aspect of that, those three or sometimes four ages in each um, environment, because we have three to six is actually four ages, is that sometimes we have those new children who come in the atrium when they're five or six. And yes, it's a little bit more challenging because um, they don't have that voracious appetite for repeating something like a three and four year old would. Right. They they go to work so quickly and like oh, we're done. But yet sometimes they are also drawn to help the younger child, mm-hmm. and so that's how it's reinforced mm-hmm. that. In the first plane, the child, the absorbent mind is that super sponge. But it doesn't mean that you can't wet the sponge again later to Mm -hmm. absorb something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think also we have to trust that the children have this natural draw towards their sensitive periods. So maybe I didn't put paper and scissors out for my child during their sensitive period of cutting. But like you said, they probably found scissors and cut something. So... (laughs) Like that caterpillar who's hungry and maybe they weren't on a leaf whenever they hatched or whatever, they went and found food. So I think that there's also like a trust in the child's natural capabilities of meeting their own needs during sensitive periods. Of course, if we can create an environment that is rich in their sensitive periods, that is ideal. But there's also like a trust in their capabilities of... I don't want to say survival, but you you understand what I mean in that, that they are able to kind of find a way to meet their needs. Yes. And, and the word trust is so key because we need to trust that the child has that inner guide. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, not all children will be doing pasting work, you know, like in a regular preschool room or the cutting work. Not all children, although I do see every child being drawn to the altar work. Yes. Like it's, yes. it's a very busy work. They're not hungry for the same food at the exact same time. Mm-hmm. But when we do observe, and that's what is so important in the Montessori method and in catechesis of the Good Shepherd, is the observation of the child and what does that child need at this particular time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And not just what's on my schedule to present in the atrium. Right, right. This was a huge aha for me as a catechist and as a mother. Like when I first was formed, I had the mindset of, okay, we do this on day one. We do this on day two. Okay, it's Advent. We need to do annunciation. We need to do visitation. Oh, and the child's asking for Magi, but it's April. Like, no, 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 we don't do Magi in April. No. So I, it was a huge aha for me to trust the child's natural instincts and what they were drawn to. So if I had a child who was asking for Magi in April, I showed the Magi in April because they were having a natural draw towards that or whatever presentation or whatever work in the atrium that they were drawn to. Um, But allowing you to let go of the schedule 
which can be really scary for a beginning catechist, but um, kind of letting go of that and looking at each child that's before you and what their needs are, which can be very difficult, especially when you're dealing with 13 kids, but, or however many you have in your atrium, but that would be the ideal is to be looking. I think that what you just said of really watching for the children's sensitive periods is one of those one of those key things for us as observers of the children in order to capitalize on these sensitive periods and when they're going to absorb the vocabulary, absorb the scripture, absorb this love that's presented right in front of them. Um, we have to be observers of those sensitive periods. Yes. And to observe, you know, what is their need at this particular time? Mm -hmm. Um, As a formation leader, you know, when we're working on album pages, we always stress the liturgical time for the particular presentation. And so the parable of the Good Shepherd, you know, the liturgical time for that is uh, usually Lent. Um, I had a a difficult lesson I learned myself the year of COVID when we were in the atrium and that last week before the lockdown, but before I knew it was going to be locked down, um, a little boy was asking for the parable of the Good Shepherd. And, you know, in my mind, it was like, oh, next week to, you know, these particular children, I'm going to present the parable of the Good Shepherd. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there were things on my schedule. (laughs) And um, I said, oh, soon, soon, very soon. And I kind of redirected him to something else. Well, then we had the lockdown. And the whole time during that ending of March and April, I just felt so bad, like, oh my gosh, this little boy was so drawn (laughs) to the Good Shepherd, the Good Shepherd's love and protection, and I missed Mm. that opportunity to share it. And so the very first week when we came back in September, (laughs) he went to the parable of the Good Shepherd, and I said, oh! would you like to see this today? (laughs) And he got this super big grin. (laughs) And it was like, oh, okay, God, let me um, make up my my great sin and mistake. (laughs) That I wasn't observing what the child needed at that time. And so it is challenging, especially new catechists. It's really challenging because we don't know the children. What are their needs? Right. We don't know what their sensitive periods are. We have these age approximations, but, you know, it's different for one three-year-old than another three-year-old. Right, right. And so that's where we really have to be open to the guidance of the Holy Spirit in us, but also trusting the Holy Spirit in each child. Mm-hmm that what are they hungry for you know as Sophia says what face of God do they need to see today what voice of God do they need to hear today Mm -hmm. and that might be different for each child yes yes (laughs) yeah Celine would you speak into other ways or strategies that as adults that we can help to use the sensitive periods in regards to the spiritual growth we spoke about being good observers of the children in their potential sensitive periods but are, are there any other things that we can do to help utilize these sensitive periods in the child's spiritual life I think one of the things is Uh, to use our prayer language naturally, to speak about God naturally. The prayer language and God's language, you know, isn't just before meals or just at mass, but any time. I remember one time taking my son uh, and his friends. We were in our minivan going to a soccer game, and before I picked up the rest of the boys. My son said, are you going to talk about God again? (laughs) Well, um, we can always ask God to help us in our (laughs) soccer game. And, you know, we can always ask God to keep us safe. (laughs) And so there are many opportunities. Uh, One day, my five-year-old grandson, when he was here, he's like, you know, 
I like coming to your house because you talk about God. Oh. Well, they have this need to hear, mm -hmm. <laughs> to hear about God. And, and so to present that language, uh, I am so impressed with so many young families that I see in church who have many children. Can you imagine how long it takes them to prepare <laughs> when sometimes I'm late for mass uh, <laughs> and I don't have any little ones? And so making that preparation time a time of grace and prayer instead mm -hmm. of just frustration, but using, I guess, just every grace-filled moment that when we're looking at a leaf, you know, when we're looking at the leaves falling down or the rain, one of the things CGS has done for me is actually, you know, nourished gratitude in me mm -hmm. uh, for all the things God has given me. But we can nourish that gratitude early yeah. and just uh, use that language of our faith early. Mm -hmm. Maria Montessori said, when mothers take their children as infants to church, that can not be replaced by that religious education later. Like that is so key and so fundamental. You know, taking the young uh, children to church outside of mass, showing them the particular objects, the statues, even beforehand. Mm, that's beautiful. I have a, a friend who is part of a group. I want to say she's up in Kansas City or something, but they have a group of young, like little, like one, two, three, four year olds, and they gather, they're like little saints or some group or something like that. And they gather once a week and they do adoration with these little bitty kids in the, in the priest or the deacon, they let them touch the monstrance beforehand and everything. And it's like 10 minutes long. And then they go and play in the park play on the playground afterwards all together and the moms get to chit chat. And I just think that is the most beautiful thing. Cause it's like what you just said, Maria Montessori said, is these littlest kids, they crave this, they crave God too, you know, and they, they're so drawn yes. towards him. They already have that, that indelible mark on their soul from their baptism that draws them towards God. So give them rich food and surrounding their environment with that richness. Yes, that richness of our faith. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's the Catholic culture, the Christian culture, exposing them to that, but at a young age, exposing yes. them to that language, as I said, so it would become the natural mother language, mm -hmm. that it's always there. You know, I was born in Poland, and when I go back to visit, by the third day, I start dreaming in Polish. <laughs> and so, you know... What if this language of our faith is just so natural that we can speak at any time? Yes. That, you know, even when that time comes, perhaps that we're in that other plane of development where, you know, there is different peer pressure and different society pressure, but we have that. Mm -hmm. We not only have that indelible mark of the baptism but we also have that interior language mm -hmm. though we have those sensorial experiences and we know how beautiful it was and how we felt mm -hmm. you know seeing jesus in that exposition of the blessed sacrament or touching that statue of mary because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. irma bombeck a long time ago uh, wrote a beautiful article about Jesus said, bring the children to me. But we say, you know, don't laugh, don't cry, don't yeah, touch, don't yeah. move, don't, don't, don't. Don't be don't. a child. Right. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, we, they need to move. They, it's so beautiful. I see children coming from the atrium who are sitting in church and they're doing the gestures the priest does, yes. you know, in their pew. And and that's Okay. And, you know, the child needs to walk out. I had a beautiful young mom this summer in our toddler course. She said the first word her child, her eight-month-old child said was, Alleluia. And when he was, And when he was processing, like he was holding, actually, she was holding an umbrella. 
and I guess he interiorized it as a processional cross or something. Yeah. And he started singing Alleluia. And she started walking around the room during our toddler course. And he was just so joy filled. Mm. It was just so beautiful to see that. Yeah. Like it's it's inside them. Mm -hmm. And so we just give them the materials and the time and the environment that they can actually do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Surrounding them with that warmth of God so that they associate the warmth with God. And it, that's that will carry yes. them through life. Uh, it, and Claire and I spoke about a little bit with those felt experiences that the children remember how they felt in that warmth and yes. God being the source of that warmth is so important. And that's, I, I, I truly yes. believe that that's what's going to carry them throughout their life and um, influence of their spiritual life. And if they have one as they grow older. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Celine, this has been so beautiful. You're such a wonderful person. And I'm so excited that you were on the podcast with us again. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's always, it's always a humble honor <laughs> uh, to be able to to share this this good news mm -hmm. and you know to to be with the children like how blessed we are to have that opportunity Amen. to share this uh, goodness of the catechesis so that more children can can walk in his light mm -hmm. and and more parents can recognize that you know their child is that light of Jesus in their home too mhm mm mhm mm Amen. Well, thank you, Celine. Thank you. God bless you, Carrie. God bless. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. I would really like to point you to chapter 10 of Listening to God with Children by Gianna Gobi. She has a whole chapter on the sensitive periods. She starts off by recalling that Montessori's first experience with religious education in Barcelona, where she rediscovered something that she had already observed in her children's house. Even before culture and doctrine are taught, there is this vital relationship between the soul of the child and with God. And it's important for us to be able to nurture the religious potential of the child both Sophia and Gianna, they felt that it was really important for the adult to understand the needs of the child in regards to their planes of development and in regards to sensitive periods. So I hope that this conversation between Celine and I today will help you better understand the child and that they already have a deep relationship with God and that a better understanding of the planes of development and their sensitive periods will help us to nourish that relationship that is already there. I will put a link to Listening to God with Children into our show notes so that you can get this book and dive deeper into this beautiful subject of sensitive periods. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. We would like to thank all the contributing members for making this podcast possible. If you would like to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd or to become a member, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening this week. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.